going. Um, so just to get us started, I have a few slides that I want to go over um, and to share before I pass it off to today's panelists. Um, but I want to say welcome to everyone and to the folks um, to day two of Force 11. Um, feel free to think about joining Force 11 if you aren't already a member. Membership to Force 11 is free, and you can learn more and become a member at the Force 11 website, which is on this slide. And before we get started today, we just want to give a thank you to our sponsors. Um, you can see our sponsor listed on this slide. Um, we also want to give thanks to our volunteers and presenters who are making this program possible. And then more information about the conference is on the slide. So all sessions are available through Zoom. Um, recordings will be made available after the event and conference information can be found on the Skenge. Um, this is a reminder that we have a code of conduct and to view that code of conduct, you can visit the Force 11 website. And then if you want, you can join the discussion on the Force 11 Slack. Um, if you haven't already joined on day one. And then mark your calendars for the Force 11 Scholarly Communication Institute. Um, more information can be found on the Force 11 website um, and registration opens this week. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my hearing and I'm going to pass it off to Mary Beth um, to get us started. Thanks, Olivia. Hi, everybody. My name is Mary Beth Barella, and I'm the Director of Business Development and Communications here at NISO, the National Information Standards Organization. I want to thank um, our panelists today, who you can see here as well as Force 11 for hosting us. And I would also like to thank those of you who are joining us today, especially those who might be joining us outside of their normal work or business hours. The theme of this session in keeping with uh, the overall theme for this conference, thinking, acting, the global and the local, is breaking down the barriers to global engagement. In other words, today we want to talk about how we can act in ways that engage and include diverse perspectives from across the global information community. Our speakers today have all worked to break down these barriers, um, whether they take the form of physical distance, different time zones, multiple languages, or what have you, as they promote open research and knowledge sharing. And they will speak to us today about those experiences, sharing some of their successes, as well as some of the challenges. Before I introduce the panel, um, we wanted to invite you in the audience to let us know um, where you're joining us from. And also, um, if there's something you'd like to hear or learn from us today to add that as well, please, you can just use the chat and Zoom to add that. Um, don't be shy. I can help get us started. Um, let's see, I am presenting today from the United States. I am in a little town called Braintree, about 12 miles south of Boston. All right, I see we've got someone from Iowa City. Thanks everybody. Perhaps reflecting um, our 1 p.m. Eastern time zone, we have, um, oh, I've got somebody next door to me in Randolph. Um, but our panelists come from all over the world. Mostly it looks like Canada and the US represented, but we do have someone joining us from the UK. All right, 
Well, I hope that you will continue to share any comments or thoughts in the chat as we continue today. We will um, go through the presentations first, but I will keep an eye on the chat as we go along. I'm sure some of the speakers will join me and we will um, try to leave time at the end to answer some of your questions. Go back to sharing my screen here. Um, on to our speakers. These are all leaders in our community and I'm really looking forward to hearing from them. Um, first, we'll have Gabby Mejias, Community and Program Manager from Datasite. Following Gabby, Susan Collins, Community Engagement Manager at Crossref. Third in our lineup today is Lombe Tembo from, uh, she's the Grant Program Officer and Engagement Lead at ORCID. And then last but certainly not least, we have Lauren Jackson, Executive Director for Region 2 of the Network of the National Library of Medicine. So please join me in welcoming them, and uh, I will turn it over to you, Gabby. Thanks, uh, Mary Beth. Yes. And um, yeah, if you can stop sharing so that I can start sharing my slides. There you go. Thank you. And Hi, uh, everyone, and yeah, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm Gabi Mejias, and um, I work at Datasite. I grew up in Buenos Aires, Argentina. I've been living in Berlin, Germany for more than 10 years, but today I'm in Buenos Aires for the CSB Conf, so it's great to be here with you today. And I'm going to... Um, share uh, with you some new initiative. Uh, we have a data site called the Global Access Program uh, that we're uh, doing to reduce barriers to, to access. And first of all, um, let me tell you about DataSite. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization uh, established in 2009, created by and for the community. Our vision is to uh, connect research and identify knowledge. We do so by enabling registration of uh, DOIs and metadata for um, a wide range of uh, research outputs, data sets, uh, samples, preprints, images, and more, and uh, organizations join DataSite as members um, to register DOIs for their outputs and resources. And um, we, uh, in, the, in the last uh, couple of years, um, we've um, yeah, identified uh, some uh, challenges in terms of adoption, mainly that although we have members in more than 50 countries, most of our membership um, are based uh, in Europe and in North America. Um, also, when we uh, look at um, why um, this happens, uh, we notice that uh, in some uh, countries, um, there's uh, a lack of underlying infrastructure, so systems like repositories, um, data repositories, and, and other systems that are needed to integrate um, DOI registration. And uh, we also note that um, in some regions, uh, there's not much awareness of the value of persistent identifier infrastructure, and also, um, last but not least, uh, financial barriers to develop this infrastructure and to adopt uh, new services. Um, so that's why uh, this year in January, um, we launched uh, our new global access program with the support of the Chan Zuckerberg uh, initiative. And um, what we want is to um, increase equity in the global uh, research ecosystem. Um, the good thing is that we don't start from, from zero, um, but actually uh, to develop uh, the, the concept of this program, um, we uh, worked with a community group um, from, from our, our current members from different regions, and um, we are going to leverage on existing uh, communities. Um, so uh, we uh, have uh, currently 56 um, consortia, um, including consortia in Latin America and in Africa and in Asia. So uh, we're going to leverage on these connections with these um, communities uh, for our activities. 
And we are going to um, do uh, this uh, through a comprehensive and integral uh, program. So um, we're going to uh, focus on uh, funding, technical infrastructure, and outreach. And um, to increase outreach, so to build or uh, increase this awareness of the importance of identifiers and metadata for research infrastructure, uh, what we want to do is partner with local communities to uh, analyze uh, both needs and opportunities for trading uh, in different uh, regions. We're going to develop educational materials, best practices, uh, policy guidance, and uh, in those regions or countries where we don't have much partnerships, we're going to uh, uh, look for new partnerships. Uh, we're going also to um, uh, set up uh, a, an ambassador's uh, program, and we're going to document uh, case studies uh, for different stakeholders. Um, in terms of infrastructure, we're also going to do an analysis of the current uh, landscape of uh, systems and platforms per regions. And uh, based on this, uh, we aim to uh, collaborate with service providers and user groups in different regions to um, increase uh, the, the integrations uh, with uh, uh, the data side DOI infrastructure. And in terms of funding, um, we're going to define the scope uh, for a global access fund. And um, we uh, are going to um, provide funding to develop underlying infrastructure needed to start using data site service. And we're also going to seek um, uh, new funding for, for this. And um, the idea of this program is to build a more equitable and inclusive uh, research ecosystem. Um, so uh, for this, a, a very important part of this is that we're onboarding um, three new colleagues, um, one based in uh, Africa, um, Bosun Obileye, who joined us uh, on Monday in Latin America, Arturo uh, Garduño, who joined also on Monday. And for Middle East and Asia, we're going to have a new colleague um, uh, as of uh, June. And um, research uh, already uh, is um, uh, global, interconnected, and very diverse. And uh, with this program, uh, we, we want to um, yeah, build uh, the infrastructure needed to um, make that uh, diversity uh, more uh, visible and transparent. And thank you for your attention. I look forward to the Q&A session. Thanks, Gabby. Um, if we had more time, I might ask you to outline that onboarding part, because I think that's so important when you're working with folks remotely. But in the meantime, we will go on to our next presenter, Susan Collins. Let's see. OK, thanks, Mary Beth. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Susan Collins. I'm a community engagement manager at CrossRef, and I am based um, in Massachusetts, which is on the east coast of the United States. Um, and as part of today's discussion of breaking down barriers to global engagement, I'm going to review several of CrossRef's programs and strategy for increasing membership accessibility. So a bit of background. Um, CrossRef is a not-for-profit membership organization, and we're open to organizations that produce professional and scholarly materials and content. Um, we work with about 20,000 member and affiliated organizations from across about 150 countries. Um, and to date, our members have registered metadata for over 144 million items with us. These include journal articles and books, reports, standards, grants, just to name a few. Um, and all of this registered metadata is openly available through our APIs. Um, and we receive about 600 million queries per month across all of our interfaces. So many people associate CrossRef with DOIs, and DOIs certainly are important, but um, one of the real values of CrossRef comes from the, all of this metadata that's registered with us. Um, and this creates a rich and reusable open network of relationships connecting organizations and people and things and actions, all to be used by the global community. However, in building this network for the global community, it really must include input from all of the global community. And if we look at where our members are joining from, 
we can see that there are gaps in this community. So when CrossFit began about 23 years ago, our first members were mainly from the US and Western Europe, um, but today membership is becoming a lot more global and diverse. Um, in the last several years, about half of our members um, have come from Southeastern Asia, Eastern Europe, and Latin America. Um, and although membership continues to grow each year, uh, we're not seeing significant membership growth from all regions. Um, specifically, there's much slower growth um, in Northern and Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Central Asia, with only about 5% of new member applications coming from these regions collectively. But we know uh, that there are organizations in these areas that are producing research outputs, but we also know that there are barriers as to why some organizations from those regions that wish to become members aren't easily able to do so. So over the years, we've had conversations um, with various communities about some of the challenges that they face. Um, and the regions may differ by region, but generally it's a combination of financial language and technical barriers. Um, not surprisingly, financial issues are one of the biggest. Um, at Crossroad members pay an annual fee, which starts at $275 per year, um, as well as fees for content that they register. Um, for some organizations, this might be an easily achievable amount, but for others, these fees might pose a challenge. Um, and then secondly, there are language barriers. Uh, as I mentioned, we have members from uh, about 150 countries, which is certainly a lot of languages. And unfortunately, we aren't able to provide support in all of them. And for organizations that need additional support, they might struggle to access the, the resources to succeed. And then third, there are some organizations that lack technical skills to know how to register metadata or to do so efficiently. Um, often they might not have the resources to gather additional metadata beyond the basics, and this can certainly impact discoverability of content and inclusion in the wider scholarly record. So to attempt to address and reduce some of these barriers, we've developed several programs to help facilitate membership. Um, and these include our Global Equitable Membership or GEM program, our Sponsors program, and our collaboration with Public Knowledge Project. And I'll look at each of these in a little bit more detail. So our GEM program um, is our newest program. So in the past, we had a limited fee assistance program, which waived the content registration fees for members that were working under specific partner arrangements. Um, and then taking from these experiences, we expanded the program to provide greater equitability and accessibility to organizations located in the least economically advantaged countries. And so the new program now encompasses the annual fee as well as content registration fees. Um, eligibility for the GEM program is based on a member's country, and our list of countries is predominantly based on the International Development Association, or IDA, list from the World Bank, which uses income classifications as well as other criteria um, for economic health. So uh, the, year, uh, the list will have an ongoing review. Countries might be added or removed uh, over time as economic situations change. Um, and the program began this past January, just a few months ago. Um, and since then, we've had uh, 50 new members that were able to join um, under the GEM program. Um, second up is our sponsors program. Now, sponsors are organizations that are generally not primary publishers themselves, but work with or publish on behalf of organizations that want to join Crossref, but are unable to do so independently. The sponsors work directly with us to provide billing, technical, and language support to the members that work through their sponsorship. So sponsors might uh, focus on a specific geographical area or language, or they might be part of an institution like a national library. Um, but focusing on a specific criteria like this helps increase coverage and adoption in that area. And sponsors are able to provide technical support in members' local language, and then liaise with our support team when needed. And each organization working with a sponsor doesn't have to pay a membership fee themselves. Sponsors pay one fee that covers all the organizations that they sponsor. And right now we have uh, about 150 sponsors from 52 countries, and they represent over 12,000 members uh, coming from 111 countries. But there's still regions where we lack sponsors, and so we continue to work with those communities um, to help identify organizations that might fit um, our sponsor program in those regions. And then third um, is our, our uh, collaboration with Public Knowledge Project. Um, and they're the developers of the Open Journal System or OJS publishing software. So OJS has over 34,000 journals and millions of items published using the software. It is one of the most widely used publishing platforms. And because so many member organizations use OJS a few years back, CrossF and PKP began a collaboration to create a less technical method for OJS users to register metadata with us and help publishers and journals take advantage of CrossF services. 
So it started with a uh, DOI XML export plugin that sent basic metadata directly to Crossref from OJS. Um, and then uh, a few years later, several additional plugins were created um, for other metadata and Crossref services, including um, reference deposit and linking, our cited by service, and then support for similarity check through Authenticate and the funder registry. And these allowed for an increase in the amount of metadata that was sent to us that could ultimately be included in the scholarly record. And we continue to work with PKP to uh, improve the overall level of support and then to create new plugins to increase uh, different types of metadata that can be sent to us. So sort of summing up, we know there isn't one solution to all the challenges that are faced by parts of the global community and what works for one region or what's an issue for one region might not be uh, applicable to another. So it's important that we work um, with each community individually to learn what unique challenges that they face, what resources they need, and then how we can best support them. So the programs I mentioned are there a start, but we continue to seek additional input and feedback um, so that we can help organizations be able to, to participate um, and contribute to the global community network. Um, and then I'm including uh, a few links here um, for resources about the programs that, um, that I've mentioned. Um, so that's it. And I look forward to um, continuing the discussion as we move on. Thank you. Thanks so much, Susan, for sharing what Crossref is doing uh, to increase global engagement. Next, we have Lombe Tembo from ORCID. Thanks, Mary Beth. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Okay, so my name is Lombe Tembo Shuma, and I'm based in Osaka, Zambia. Um, so I work for ORCID as their grant program officer and engagement lead. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to start by saying a bit about ORCID before I move on to, to the grant, to the GPP. So ORCID is a global research infrastructure organization, which is registered in the U.S., and our mission is to enable transparent and trustworthy connections between researchers, their contributions, and their affiliations by providing a unique persistent identifier for individuals that they can then use as they engage in research, in scholarship, and also innovation activities. So what is the Global Participation Program? Um, it's a program that is feeding into one of the strategic, um, um, that into the, a strategic plan that we're working on towards 2025. And a very uh, important insight here is that there is universal uptake of ORCID, which is inherent to our mission, but it's it's not as equitable as we would want it to be. And uh, even our current member organizations think that it's important that ORCID then um, is adopted universally. So we're trying to uh, put in these structures to make sure that we can increase that um, the uptake of ORCID around the world. Um, so we continue to see growing adoption around the world with users of ORCID in 250 countries um, and member organizations in 57 countries. So we have over 1,000 organizational members with over 4,000 active integrated member systems. Um, and so as you can see from this map, the, the green represents the National ORCID Consortia and the blue represents ORCID members. And where the problem lies is where you see the gray because that's mainly in the global south and it shows that there's very little ORCID uptake in those specific focus communities. So um, ORCID adoption is higher in countries with higher income levels. And this is based on an, an analysis of ORCID adoption, which was established, um, which was done by uh, 59, by established authors in 59 countries using dimensions, cross-ref, and ORCID data. And while this is indicative, this data points to the disadvantages that researchers in the Global South face as they try to get equitable visibility and recognition for their work. Um, so ORCID's Global Participation Program is a two-pronged approach to achieving this goal. Uh, the first one being the Membership Equity Program, and the second one being the Global Participation Fund, which I will talk about in, in, a, in the next slide. So the first one, which we call the Membership Equity Program, or the MEP, is about is basically um, used when people are trying to form consortia. 
And what happens is that we have a discounted membership fee structure for consortium members, depending on what, um, whether they come from a low income country or a lower middle income country. So for those that come from low income countries, there is an 80% discount. And for those from lower middle income countries, there is a 50% discount. And these classifications are based on the World, the World Bank income classifications. Uh, and then secondly, there's a lower threshold of three members for the initial year if the members are coming from um, any of these focused communities. And uh, the MEP is fully funded by ORCID. And then on the other hand, we have the Global Participation Fund. And this has two grant programs. The first one being the Community Development and Outreach Program. And this is to fund local partners who would who are trying to build ORCID communities of practice in the global south. And we also have technical integration grants to fund development of systems that are likely to drive participation in the global south. Um, so this we actually have the second the second cycle running, um, and the deadline is the third of May. This will be the second cycle that we have because the first one was last year, and we managed to get five. Uh, five grantees who are currently running their projects. Um, so in terms of the objectives and structure of the GPF, um, I spoke about the focus communities earlier. And um, just to zone in on this, it's basically organizations that are engaged in research and scholarship in low and lower middle income countries, uh, specifically in the global south, where ORCID participation has been low to date. And in terms of the goals, we're trying to feed into these three goals um, to remedy ORCID participation gaps in the focus community areas. And this is, um, we're doing this by providing grants to, to develop ORCID communities of practice um, in the focus communities. And secondly, to build understanding and use of ORCID in local contexts. And lastly, we're trying to create and enhance technical integrations that would then support these burgeoning communities. Um, so these grants are intended to do the following. Um, so in the sense that we have two different grant programs. So the, the community development and outreach grants are trying to build and support communities. And this is basically to support local partners who can go on to build ORCID communities of practice. And these, um, these grants can also be used for local outreach, for training, and also for tech support resources that can create and grow ORCID consortia in the focus communities. Um, and then for the technical integration grants, these ones are intended to build integrations, to build utilities, and also for support use. So basically what we're trying to do here is to build or update ORCID integrations in open source systems, which are likely to support and encourage ORCID participation by those in focus communities. Um, so that is the end of my presentation. And I look forward to the Q&A at the end of this. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, thanks for reminding everyone. Um, if you have any questions or things you want to adjust to the panelists, you can enter those in chat. But before we get to our Q&A, we have Lauren Jackson. Great, thank you, Mary Beth, and to the other panelists. So my name is Lauren Jackson, and I am the executive director for the Region 2 Regional Medical Library as part of the network of the National Library of Medicine. As my fellow panelists have done, what I'm going to do first is give you some background about what we do in the NNLM. So our network structure is like it starts at the highest level at the National Institutes of Health, all the way down to the regional medical libraries which I'm a part of that provides education and funding opportunities throughout our service area. And I'll get into what our service area is on the next slide, but just wanna mention that it is free to sign up and become an individual member or an organizational member for any of the regional medical libraries throughout the United States. For region two, this is our service area. So you can see that it includes Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, South Carolina, where our headquarters are and where I work from, Tennessee, as well as the US Virgin Islands. So a bit about our structure and the organization of our staffing model, we have an advisory team and also an administrative team and a strategist team. 
At the advisory level, we have Shannon Jones, who's our director and principal investigator. And then our program advisor is Heather Holmes. So the two of them really give us the, the overview about what we're supposed to do, how we uh, interface with the National Library of Medicine and make some of those larger decisions through the National Program Steering Committee, which is comprised of other directors and principal investigators to understand what we're supposed to do at a programmatic level with our members. Our administrative team is pretty sparse right now. It's just me. Um, you can see that we have two other vacant positions, and I'll talk about some of the issues that that creates in a moment. But these are, or this is my role, as well as the different uh, liaison responsibilities that I have to certain areas within Region 2. This is our strategist team. So with their various responsibilities, Sarah, Sarah, Elizabeth, and Deborah are responsible for the programmatic elements and education pieces uh, that really structure the on the ground work uh, that we do with our members. And we do have one vacant position there as well. So some of the issues that I wanted to talk about today, um, the first one has to do with onboarding and team building. So for our team itself and our staffing model, we were primarily remote from September of 2021 when we started working together to January 2022. Um, working primarily remotely created some issues with establishing trust as well as psychological safety because we were only connected online through Microsoft Teams, which is what the medical university uses that we work from, as well as with our other network colleagues. Uh, we had varying technological skills, so managing as a remote team was quite difficult instead of being in person and being able to check in with team meetings in real time. And also, there are differences with communication. Uh, I think we all know that some people are very different when you're working together virtually than when you're in person. So that created some issues as well around cultural differences. Um, I am someone who is from New York originally. And you know, one of the ways that we communicate is very direct. In the Southeastern United States, there is a different method of communication. And so that could become uh, you know, off-putting to some people because of the different ways that we communicate. There's also high turnover throughout the network. We are uh, operating with a limited term period. So we're on a cooperative agreement that runs for five years. It's not guaranteed. So that means that people constantly cycle through the network in different positions. There's often precarious employment within information science and lots of things have changed in terms of hiring with employee satisfaction, in terms of realizing what they can do with working remotely and really striving for that in different places where they work. So that can create barriers to who you hire in terms of having a full staffing model to providing services throughout a wide regional service area like we have. I want to talk a bit about the national initiatives that we all collaborate on throughout the NNLM. Uh, for this cooperative agreement, they center around these three, confronting health misinformation, bridging the digital divide, and environmental determinants of health. So within each of our different regional medical libraries, we're responsible for thinking about how we can meet those needs in tandem with what other folks are doing throughout the network with what we provide our members. So we decided to focus on our second grant year, which ran from May 2022 to this month on emergency and disaster preparedness, as well as some of these other goals. So I just wanted to give sort of a high level view of some of the ways we were hoping to accomplish meeting some of those national initiatives. One that I want to highlight is around emergency response and preparedness. So FEMA, or the Federal Emergency Management Agency, is something that we reference quite a bit in our work in our region, uh, because throughout the south southeastern United States, as well as with Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, there are environmental concerns around hurricanes, tornadoes, flooding. Um, and so with thinking about that and how we're hurricane prone, that does impact our service model. One of the ways that we attempted to respond to that is that um, part of our service model is providing funding to our different members and member organizations. And we revitalized our uh, award that folks could apply for with the Emergency Preparedness and Response Award to extend beyond natural disasters, such as weather-related emergencies, to other sorts of local emergencies that were emerging more and becoming more prevalent throughout the country, but particularly in the United States, um, in the Southeastern United States. So that included uh, hate crimes, intimate partner violence, and gun violence and shooting. So when people want to apply for funding, we wanted to open it up to initiatives that prevent or respond to those emergencies as much as other types of emergencies that have to do with weather or climate. 
In addition, we know that there are barriers to membership engagement throughout our service area. Sometimes it's difficult to visit different places because of the uh, what is happening in, with flooding or hurricanes. And also there are some concerns throughout the Southeastern United States with safety for members of our team who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. So that can make it difficult to engage with certain uh, communities that we serve as well as digital literacy uh, throughout the Southeastern United States, access to technology, particularly during emergencies. Uh, those tend to not be as readily accessible. Wi-Fi goes down, um, hotspots are inaccessible. And since we're remote and we try to communicate with our membership in that way, it can be very difficult to reach out to them and offer support when we can't even talk or when we can't get in touch. Um, also prioritization throughout our service area. So different parts of our region and the wide you know, service area that we have required have different needs and need different things from us. And so being able to provide all of those things in a way that is equitable can create great challenges for us. And we're constantly thinking about that. Overall, these are the components of our program model for what we do in the regional medical libraries. And I want to talk a bit about membership outreach and engagement and some of the challenges and opportunities here. So again, you know, we prefer to visit people in person, our membership um, with individual members and organizational. That's really difficult with a small and reduced staff right now. And it creates strain on in-office workflows when one of us visits a conference and the people that are still back here as part of our four-person team right now uh, can handle those kinds of troubleshooting or questions that come in. Also having language uh, diversity and accessibility through language. Um, so we have a high Spanish speaking population through the area in which we serve. There are different dialects in different places that we visit. So being able to meet people with those language concerns is really important. And it also helps our membership feel more safe when they know someone can communicate in the ways that they do. Also cultural competency with island communities. There's a complex history with mainland United States histories of colonization that we need to be aware of. Also conceptualizations of time and responsiveness um, in a, again, going back to the New York standard, um, it can be very much like a fast turnaround or instant and urgent responses is what is uh, really highlighted and prioritized in some of the places where we work, it takes them longer. And that's for a variety of different reasons, including cultural responsiveness um, for how they just communicate and who they are. There's also hesitancy with the government um, that I want to acknowledge. Since we are a government run organization, different places have different experiences with that. We also serve a wide range of service areas. So we have places that are rural, suburban, urban. So we need to be aware of that. We include different member organizations and individual members that come from a variety of backgrounds. We have different knowledge of grant literacy, educational and class privilege, and also uh, the membership of our team needs to be very inclusive for different folks. So I'm going to end there and just say that those are some of our biggest concerns and questions that we have, and I appreciate the time. Thank you. Wow, thanks, Lauren, for sharing some of um, your challenges in the southeastern United States um, I, and in your library network region. I think those are, um, some of those are, are unique or maybe not things we think about um, immediately when such as the environmental uh, barriers and, and uh, natural disasters. So at this time, we, we do have time um, for some questions. And I, I thought we might start, um, by the way, audience, if you would like to turn your camera on at this time, you certainly can. If you prefer not to, the, and you just want to leave it off, that's okay too. Um, if you have a question, um, you can put that in the in the chat, um, or if you raise your hand, I'll try to keep my eye on that and, and see, um, but chat's fine too. So one of the questions that came in early on, and I think it, it might relate to your talk, Lauren, is um, the question about um, supporting global health researchers at my institution who do a lot of collaborative and capacity building work with colleagues in low resource environments.
Yeah, so I can jump in. Um, I think with this question about uh, working with global health researchers with capacity building is to really hear from the folks who work in those low resource environments. So not to try to think for them or sort of, um, you know, estimate or project what you think their needs are, but rather to give them the opportunity to tell you directly after you've established those relationships, what their issues are and what they struggle with and then respond to that. I think that's just a really good practice from a user experience model. Um, and it doesn't often happen, but I found that to be the most successful in my work. Thanks, Lauren. Do any of our speakers have anything to add? Yes. Um, so um, one one point that uh, came out at the, the conference I'm at today uh, is um, volunteer work as um, not a virtue, but a problem, uh, because obviously um, those more privileged can donate um, their, their time or work for free. And I think this is um, very related, especially for, for, for those of us who work in scholarly communications where there's a lot of volunteer uh, work. And uh, one of the keynote speakers, Laura Sion from Metadocencia, which is a, a Latin American organization mentioned that, yeah, one of the ways to address this is um, for, for these organizations or for these initiatives to become sustainable, for example, through funding and uh, their organizations like the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative um, that yeah has uh, funding uh, available for um, open science um, communities. So maybe one one way of addressing this is to support um, uh, communities uh, organizations to uh, yeah become sustainable so that they have the resources to really um, dedicate time um, yeah to capacity building and other activities. Okay. I can say what, oh, Susan, oh, please. Oh, sorry. No, I can just say, say what Lauren had talked about was, um, you know, when we do start to work, have conversations with communities, it's just, as she said, to, to have conversations and don't make assumptions about what a community needs. You know, don't impose what we think our values are on, on a particular community. Um, and just because we think it, something worked great somewhere else doesn't mean that it's going to work well everywhere. So I think that sort of going in with sort of an open mind and sort of willingness to listen, I think is probably one of the most important things we can do. Thanks, Susan. There's a question that came up when we were preparing this uh, panel that that I, I that I think we can squeeze in before we go back to the chat, and I, I very much like this question: How do your own personal circumstances and experiences affect how you've approached global engagement? And um, panelists, I'll, I'll let you jump in as you as you wish. I could go. Um, I think for me, especially having lived and worked in Zambia all my life, and also with 10 years of experience basically managing projects, um, um, mainly where you know the, the funding is coming from the outside. And um, in some instances, I'll pick up on what Susan said about how um, those decisions about how to spend that money are sort of imposed on the people who are receiving that funding. Um, that for me has really, it's 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 allowed me to look at it in a different way. So even as I started my role at Orchid, and uh, with a focus on global engagement, I have all these different um, experiences, and I've been exposed to certain things that allow me to, um, you know, to to have an open mind and to also remember that, um, you know, you can't you can't impose all your ideas on on communities and that they should have. Um, their input, even as you're trying to organize, um, to come up with programs and that sort of thing. So I think that's been my biggest, um, that's been my biggest takeaway on how I approach global engagement. Thank you for sharing that experience. So, um, 
Speakers, would any um, of you like to add to what Lambe said or to share your own personal experience? Um, I have a couple of comments, I guess. Um, I, I think, um, so when, when I first started with CrossF, most of our, our community engagement was either based in the US or uh, UK, and that's where our members were, were kind of based. And as our membership sort of grew and, and expanded, we started to do more local events um, in different communities. And I think having, having been able and having the, the privilege of being able to attend and, and events throughout the world really started to shape how you see, uh, how, you, how you just approach things differently. Um, and you know, learning and being able to learn about a community by being there and talking with people in person and seeing what's important culturally, seeing what the obstacles are um, and you're able to take those experiences home I think that really helps to to shape future engagement and that you're able to continue those relationships online or through you know through webinars virtually um, so I think that that certainly shaped my experience um, with being able to work um, more globally with our members yeah I agree with Susan and Lambe and what they contributed I think that um, being very fortunate to have uh, language skills in Spanish and French has been very helpful for me in my work um, and helping people communicate and feel safe communicating with me, uh, particularly in the areas that we serve. I also think that uh, being a Black librarian is really powerful in the Southeast. Uh, there were times with the history of the United States where Black people weren't allowed to use libraries or be able to read. Um, and so showing that and, and helping other folks to see that it is safe to, to go into the library or that we want to create safer spaces um, to use those materials is really helpful. And then also um, I identify as someone who lives with disabilities. And so working in a health science library, you know, and sharing as I feel safe to or that is appropriate with some of the people that we serve because of the uh, disparate health outcomes throughout the Southeast and with the region that we serve um, has been uh, very helpful. Um, in other ways, kind of being maybe a little bit younger Younger and coming from a different environment from uh, the Northeast United States to the South has created barriers and has been difficult sometimes to communicate with other people. Thanks, Lauren. Um, if there if there are no no other comments on those uh, sort of personal insights into breaking down the barriers. Um, Hi, Eric. I see you turned on your your camera, and um, you had a question um, in our chat. I believe would you would you like to ask it directly to the to the panelists? Yeah. Hi. First of all, I want to acknowledge uh, what Samantha Porter said uh, in response to my question, which was that Lauren had uh, addressed my question um, moments after I asked it. In a way. Um, but uh, the question is uh, really based upon um, getting past some of the uh, the tactical similarities um, that are being faced, you know, um, and what, if any, uh, you know, from the United States perspective, you know, national legislation, movements, uh, critical votes, um, or elections that are happening uh, that could be uh, dealt with or discussed that could help move the needle for any of you. Uh, those of you who have uh, are part of uh, you know government run organizations uh, as was discussed or NGOs or you know etc. And um, my concern also has to do with moving across borders because we do take the U.S. centric perspective very often. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm curious about what continuity there might be um, across continents even. Um, so what fights need to be fought? Who needs to be fought? Who needs to be persuaded? Um, what's really, really, really getting in your way, um, aside from some of the obvious stuff, systemic racism and blah, blah, I just want to know, um, you know, what's really on the agenda right now. That's it. Thanks. I'm, I'm outside, so pardon the sunglasses. And, and that question is open to, to all of the speakers, right? So I can I can uh, start and thanks for um, the question, um, Eric. Um, so yeah, I from uh, 
yeah, uh, my, my experience working uh, with communities in Latin America and Africa, uh, especially, um, but also, uh, yeah, uh, like uh, I think you said, uh, in the US, um, political challenges are um, a thing um, everywhere, right? And um, even, yeah, government changes uh, represent a challenge uh, for continuity of 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 uh, services acquisition um, etc um, um, what uh, has has helped uh, organizations like like data site is that um, we um, for example we have a consortium model so um, we work with an organization that uh, is interested in becoming a consortium lead organization in a certain um, country uh, and then uh, that organization is like um, our local uh, ambassador and uh, they um, uh, multiply uh, what we do in their countries and they also take this um, ownership of, of the service that we provide in this case PID infrastructure and uh, we support them uh, uh, to yeah um, yeah, provide uh, these these services, but yeah, we rely um, a lot on on them, and yeah, it takes a lot of effort to sort out uh, these these challenges. Um, and yeah, we had this this discussion um, uh, here uh, in in these events in in our in Argentina, where there's a lot of uh, inflation and a lot of uh, financial issues associated to. Uh, currency uh, conversion because the economy is uh, dollarized and this uh, increases uh, the challenges. Um, but yeah, on the on the discussion we had, uh, it came up that it's about starting somewhere, uh, even uh, like doing what you can and then try to uh, maintain that. And that's already a lot of effort. Uh, and then trying to to uh, keep going and, and improving that, but we rely a lot in local partnerships. I can jump in as well. Um, so just like Gabby, Orchid has this um, a similar uh, consortium model, but in addition to that, we also rely quite heavily on um, organizations that are recognized at national and regional level. So in my case, where I mainly deal with the global south, um, it's it's usually, uh, we usually interact directly with the national, um, you know, the, the NRENs, so the, the research and education networks at national level, and also those in regional level. So that's, that's what helps us in terms of that, of addressing that political aspect of it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I can jump into another thing that we try to offer Eric um, through the Regional Medical Library educational offerings are free trainings for people to take about some of these issues. So one that is, you know, impacting a lot of our communities are uh, book bannings and censorship. So having free trainings about what to do if that happens to you or if that's in your community has been well received. I think also um, active bystander training. Uh, for, you know, the rise in crimes against uh, folks who are from Asian communities, um, anti-Blackness, or also for anti-Semitism, uh, so that people can step in uh, when they see something happening and support in their communities as a response. So providing that free training has been successful for us as a way to address some political issues. Thank you. I think, thank you. Uh, I, we also, I think we have time for one more question. It's a very good question that um, our attendee Veronica uh, entered into the chat, and that's about um, working across languages. So um, all speakers have mentioned the importance of offering content and collaborations in other languages, but I would like to hear more about the practical challenges of translating materials not having translators for less common languages, um, et cetera. Do you have any best practices or, or approaches um, that you can share from, from your work? I can start with this one. Um, so we have an ambassador program uh, where we have volunteers from communities throughout the world um, that um, 
work with us. They're kind of liaisons between us and their communities. So a lot of times they're able to translate materials or um, present webinars on our behalf. Um, the, the languages, you know, we have some staff that are a multilingual, but for us common um, languages, the ambassadors have been um, very much um, a valuable resource for us in being able to connect with communities. Okay, and I see Lauren, thank you. You entered your res uh, a response to the question in the chat. Um, any, any other comments to share on, on this question of working across uh, multiple languages? So, um, yeah, from uh, my experience um, with data site, um, we are a remote only organization and that allows us to, um, yeah, uh, have staff in different countries and obviously that allows us to to have that speaks uh, staff that speaks multiple languages also a lot of my colleagues are migrants and migrants uh, speak uh, multiple uh, languages um, as well um, so um, yeah that also uh, helps to have a diverse uh, team Any final thoughts? All right, well, I want to um, thank our speakers, uh, Lauren, Abby, Lombe, and Susan. Thank you so much for sharing your, your time and experiences with us. And um, Olivia, as our host, do you have anything to say before we uh, move on to the next session? Yeah, all I have to say is thank you all for this great panel session. Um, this was wonderful. Um, I included some information in the chat to the next session. Um, so we have some presentations that will begin on the hour. Um, so please feel free to use that Zoom link in the chat to go to that next session. Um, and with that, that's all I have to say. All right, thanks all. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Okay.